Welcome to today's video. Today we'll be talking about groundwater and karst. I'm Aida Awad from Broward College. Let's take a look at the learning targets for this video. First, we'll be discussing the occurrence and movement of groundwater specifically as it relates to Florida groundwater. We'll be talking about comparing and contrasting springs, geysers, wells, and artesian systems, and looking at some of these located in Florida. We'll list and describe the major environmental problems associated with surface and groundwater systems. We'll talk about some karst features and caves. First of all, very basics on groundwater and groundwater storage. In the picture here, we can see starting on the left side, a situation where all of the grains of sediment or particles are butted right up against each other. There are no pore spaces for water to fill in. And because there are no pore spaces, there are no interconnected pore spaces, so this is a non-porous and non-permeable sample. In the middle, we have some pore spaces, but those pore spaces are poorly connected. And on the far right, we can see that the pore spaces in this rock are more well connected, so that rock is more permeable. And we'll come back and talk about porosity and permeability in a minute. But right now, in terms of storing groundwater, the sample on the left side has very little or no space to store groundwater, while the sample on the right side has more available space to store groundwater. So the groundwater that is stored underground does get stored in pore spaces within rock and within unconsolidated, unconsolidated sediments. And water flows through this rock and sediment very slowly. Typically, the flow rates are only a few centimeters to meters per day. And groundwater tends to collect above materials that we're going to call aquacludes or aquitards that are impermeable. So thinking specifically about porosity, porosity is the amount of space in between sediment grains that includes cracks or fractures in the rocks. And these spaces may be filled with water or air or a mixture of both. And just to get some ideas about porosity, on the right-hand side, we have a chart that shows us, and let's start at the bottom here, glacial till, so a very mixed sediment, poorly sorted sediment, has a very low porosity of 10 to 20 percent. Clays, surprisingly, have porosities of anywhere from 35 to 80 percent. Silt grains, anywhere from 35 to 50 percent, about the same as clean sand, and gravel, has a porosity of about 25 to 40 percent. In terms of permeability, permeability is the ability of a material to transmit water. So a rock may have a high porosity, but if those pore spaces are not interconnected, the permeability could be low. And aquifers, by definition, are materials that can transmit large quantities of water in the surface beneath our feet. So here we see three examples. Uh, on the left-hand side, a more extreme case, some gravel that has a high porosity and allows high permeability. So we see the specific yield is fairly high here, and that would allow for rapid drainage. In the center, a fine sand we see has a fairly high porosity and a fairly high specific yield, which would allow for moderate drainage. But notice that the sand will tend to filter out more particles than would the gravel. And then on the right, we have both clay with a low specific yield and then solid rock, which we're going to say is essentially impermeable. In terms of the groundwater system, we have several different areas that we need to talk about. First of all, the water table. The water table is the top of the saturated zone and it separates the unsaturated zone from the saturated zone. In the unsaturated zone, that's the ground surface down to the water table, the pores in that area may be partially filled with water or they may be filled with air. Also in the unsaturated zone is an area we call the capillary fringe, and the capillary fringe is just above the water table, and that's where capillary forces pull water up into the pore spaces. Below the water table in the saturated zone, all of the pore spaces are completely filled in with water. The water table effectively fluctuates seasonally with dry and wet seasons, but it also mirrors the surface topography. So you can see in this diagram here 
that the surface is hilly with a stream or a lake and then another hill, and that the water table itself, it's the dashed line in the dry season, slightly lower than it is the solid line in the wet season. So how does that water get into the aquifer in the first place? Well, water enters the aquifer through the recharge zone. And this is a um, watershed picture here on the top left, and we can see that water is falling across this entire area. Some of it is running off into the streams, and some of it is soaking into the ground. Some of that water that soaks into the ground does recharge or refill this aquifer material along here. We can also see in the picture on the bottom right a little cartoon of South Florida. So we have rainfall here over the Everglades and over the areas close to the, the coastline. And that is the recharge zone for what we're going to call the Biscayne Aquifer. That is the shallow aquifer that underlies both the Everglades and the areas where uh, we live along the coastline. And that's our recharge zone. But you will also notice that underneath Biscayne Bay, there is some seawater that is starting to push in towards the shoreline and push in underground. So we have a layer of seawater and then we have a layer of brackish water, so mixed seawater with fresh water. And that seawater is intruding into the aquifer, the Biscayne Aquifer. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about saltwater intrusion. How do we know what direction groundwater is flowing? So which way will the water flow? Well, certainly the water will always flow downhill with the hydraulic gradient. So the hydraulic gradient is nothing more than the slope of the water table. And we can see a nice drawing of it here in the top right corner where we have a hillside and the water table is effectively mirroring that topography. And so we can calculate the slope, the change in elevation over the distance along that water table. And that's our hydraulic gradient. Now, in some cases, such as in the case of Central Florida, we can infer the height of the water table from things like water levels in wetlands, lakes, and springs. So in this little drawing at the bottom, we see the water table here intersecting the surface as it flows through a wetland. And we could take this elevation of this lake water level, and we could call that the water table level. Likewise, we see a spring in this area here in the middle, and then further lake as we continue down slope. So if you compared the elevation of the water in the wetland with the elevation of the water in the spring and the elevation of the water in the lake, you would easily be able to see that the lake was the lowest elevation and therefore water would be flowing downhill toward the lake from the wetland and from the spring. That brings us to talking about wells. Wells are nothing more than holes that are drilled into the saturated zone or into the aquifer. And there are three main types of wells that we'll talk about, an artesian well, a non-flowing artesian well, and a flowing artesian well. So in this picture, we can see examples of the different types of wells, and we need to know what kind of aquifer we're dealing with to identify the type of well. We need to know if we're looking at an unconfined aquifer, which is where water is not confined by impermeable layers. In other words, water can recharge that aquifer from the surface, and it can flow out through the aquifer. The water moves freely through that aquifer. And the level of water in the wells in an unconfined aquifer is the same level as the water table itself. So here in the top center portion, we see a water table well. This is an unconfined aquifer. The well is dug into that unconfined aquifer and the level of water in that well rises up so that it's the same level as the water table. Now, wells that are drilled into confined layers are drilled into aquifers that are sandwiched in between two impermeable layers. And we see the flowing artesian well, and we see the non-flowing artesian well. Two different situations. If you notice, in the non-flowing artesian well, the well head here is actually above the water table and above the potentiometric surface. However, in the flowing artesian well, because the wellhead is below that surface, water will be forced from the aquifer up and out of that well without pumping it. Overpumping from wells can cause problems. When there is more water removed from a well that is being recharged into that particular area, 
what will form is a cone of depression. So a cone of depression is a localized lowering of the water table that is caused by overpumping or pumping at a rate exceeding the recharge rate in the aquifer. So all water intrusion. So we have two pictures here. The top one shows a coastal well right here before excessive pumping. So let's look at the, the layout here. We have sea level here and ocean water shown here. And that ocean water is permeating the ground here. So we have salty groundwater in this portion of the underground system. The well itself is in an unconfined layer here. So there's recharge entering that aquifer from the surface. And the well is dug into a nice fresh water system. However, as we can see in the bottom picture, if we pump extensively from that well, what we will do is cause a cone of depression to form around the well, and we may pull salty groundwater from the surrounding area up into the well, contaminating that particular well. So this is a situation of salt water intrusion. Turning now to caves and karst, we'll start with sinkholes. The map in the top right-hand corner shows the extent of karst topography across the United States, and I think you might be surprised to recognize that the area that you live in is also covered in one form of karst or another. So the dashed lines here show evaporate rocks, such as salts and gypsums. The darker color is karst from evaporite rock, and the lighter caramel color is karst from a carbonite rock. So we have two different types of sinkholes that typically form. The first one is a little bit less serious, and it's called a cover subsidence sinkhole. And what happens in that situation is that there is some dissolution of that carbonate rock under the ground. There's no disturbance at the surface yet, the surface here being overlaid mostly in sandy materials. As water seeps down through that sand and into the underlying limestone or carbonate rock, it begins to dissolve it away along the cracks and fractures and may open up a void space. Those void spaces may fill in with some sand, this is called piping, and continued fill-in may cause the surface to begin to bow down, and you find that you have some subsidence at the surface as those near-surface materials slide downwards to fill in the cavity in the underlying carbonate rock. So that's a cover subsidence sinkhole. A cover collapse sinkhole begins to form in a very similar way. These materials may be more clay-like than sand-like, that clay material doesn't filter into that carbonate rock, those voids that have opened up, as easily as the sand does. And so some of those voids remain open. And eventually, the ceiling may not have enough strength to support the overlying material and may collapse, forming that dramatic sinkhole. We're going to see a couple of pictures of those in just a moment. So we have two pictures of houses or other structures that have been taken in by sinkholes. And in the middle, we have an aerial view of some of the sinkholes that have formed lakes in central Florida. So you can see that they have a typical rounded shape, and each one of these is a sinkhole that may be as much as two to 300 feet across. Finally, turning to cave formations. So we've talked in terms of karst of dissolution, and in this case, we're talking about deposition deposition of carbonate material into cave formations. So the typical cave formations that you might be lucky enough to see if you get a chance to go into a cave are things like stalactites that hang down from the ceiling, stalagmites that grow up from the floor, a column where stalactites and stalagmites meet one another. And you can see some beautiful pictures of those cave formations here in this picture. I think we're ready to go back and check on our learning targets and head off and take the mastery check quiz. So we talked about the occurrence and movement of groundwater, specifically how it moves in Florida. We compared and contrasted springs. We didn't really talk about geysers, but we did talk about different types of well systems. And we talked about some environmental problems and surface problems with groundwater systems. We also looked at some karst features and some caves. Please take your mastery check quiz and I'll see you in class.